My name is Rene Descartes. Now, I would never dream of telling you how you should think, but I want to offer you an explanation of how I have tried to use my own reason. I put this forth merely as a history, or a tale, for you to consider. The thing about reason, is that we all seem to think we have enough of it, and we're probably right about that. We have enough reason. We disagree because we are not using our reason in the same way. Now, I have been fortunate to have had the best education available. For a long time I expected to get knowledge from my education, but it didn't work out that way. After I completed the entire course of study, I found myself involved in so many doubts and errors, that I became convinced that, in all my attempts to gain knowledge, the only result was the discovery, at every turn, of my own ignorance. Now I won't say that education is useless. It just doesn't give us any knowledge. For example, I don't think oratory or poetry, as nice as they are, can be taught. And as for theology, I'm French, and I revered our Catholic theology. I aspired as much as anyone to reach heaven, but I realized that this way to heaven is open to stupid morons as much as to intelligent people and intelligence doesn't help much in understanding truth revealed from heaven by God. I mean, come on, that's truth, but it's not knowledge. And don't even get me started about philosophy. It's just endless disagreement. You can't possibly pick up any knowledge there, or in any of the sciences that have philosophy as their foundation. Now, mathematics is different. That's a source of real knowledge, but so far no one has really found much usefulness in that knowledge. It's like a solid foundation with nothing built on it. And the writings of ancient ethicists are the exact opposite. Splendid palace is built on no rational foundation at all. In short, the old way of doing education, the old scholastic medieval way, just isn't working. Obviously I needed to try something else if I was ever going to know anything at all. So I resolved to study myself, and the great book of the world. I studied the world first. I traveled and listened and observed and, again, I found nothing but disagreement and confusion. So I eventually resolved to make myself an object of study. I happened to be in Germany at the time, and it was winter, and I was blessed with some peace and quiet. So I spent a day all alone, just, thinking, and I came up with a plan. Before I tell you my plan I'd better explain something. We believe some things because we believe other things. One belief is based on another, like a brick in a wall. The whole system of things we believe is like a house. Well, a house needs a strong foundation. And the basic problem with what people believe these days is that beliefs are haphazardly based on other beliefs, with no solid foundation at all. Knowledge these days is like a house built on a foundation of sand, and built rather badly. So here's what my idea was, tear, the, whole, thing, down tear down the old system of belief and rebuild a new system in its place, and there's only one way to tear down the old system of belief, and that, is, doubt, ruthless, systematic, doubt, my idea was to doubt everything I could find the slightest reason to doubt, if I found out a belief was less than 100% certain, it would have to go, if a belief came from a source less than 100% reliable, doubt it, if I could even imagine the possibility that a belief was false, doubt it, and, after all that doubting, I would surely find something, some belief, that could not be doubted, and that would mean that it would be absolutely certain. And therefore such a belief would be fit to be at the foundation of the new structure of knowledge. So, my idea was to find such an undoubtable belief, and, rebuild. Rebuild the house of knowledge on that solid foundation. Now this was a big plan and I wasn't going to be able to put it into action soon. And all the ethical principles I had been brought up on were subject to doubt. I couldn't be sure they would turn out to be right, but I had to find some way of living until I could put my plan into action. So I came up with a provisional code of morals. First, I resolved to just go along with the opinions that enjoyed the most popularity and prestige in my society, even though I wasn't quite sure any of them were true. Second, I resolved to stick with my tentative opinions once I had adopted them. That way, even if I was going in the wrong direction sometimes, at least I might end up somewhere. Third, I resolved to change myself to fit the world, rather than try to do it the other way around. 
In other words, I adopted the ancient and medieval ethical principle of accepting what is, of changing my desires to fit the world rather than trying to amend the world according to my own desires, and, finally, I reviewed the different occupations people can have, and confirmed what I had always suspected, my chosen occupation in life, the pursuit of the truth, was the best of them all, and that, was the end of my thoughts for that day. And after that I waited a long time for the right opportunity. I spent nine years, just observing the world. Finally, one day when I happened to be in Amsterdam, and happened to be at leisure, I was able to put my plan into action. Now remember, my method was doubt, but its purpose was certainty. So, what can be doubted, nearly everything. And that's what I doubted, I noticed, first, that my senses are unreliable. Taste, sight, smell, hearing, touch, they've often let me down. So I doubted whether anything I've believed about the world based on my senses is true. I doubted that the world outside my mind is the way it appears to be. Then I realized that the very nature and even the existence of the world outside my mind can be doubted. Think about it. It's easy to imagine ways the world outside the mind could be totally different from the way it appears to me to be. I could be in a virtual reality. I could be in a mad scientist's laboratory hooked up to wires and receiving information from a computer program. Maybe I don't even have a whole body maybe I am just a brain in that laboratory, and worse, I could be, just a mind, floating in space, without so much as a brain, dreaming of a world where I have a body, or maybe God isn't a nice God. Maybe God is a prankster enjoying a cruel joke at my expense, or maybe instead of God there is, a terrible demon with godlike powers deceiving me. And maybe all my perceptions of the world are the result of his trickery. Maybe I'm not even a mind floating in space. Maybe three-dimensional space is itself part of the illusion. Maybe I am. Just. A. Mind, without even a space to float around in. These scenarios are not probable, but they're possible. And so I had to doubt that the world was at all the way I perceived it to be, and even that it exists, I considered. Next, whether I might fall back on reason, surely two and two make four, no matter what, right? Right? Wrong. I realized I could doubt this too. Reason has failed me in the past so maybe it is always unreliable. And worse, if God is a prankster, or if a malevolent omnipotent being wanted to deceive me into thinking that two plus two equals seventeen billion, they could do it. They could even make it seem obvious to me. Like 2 plus 2 equals 4 seems obvious to me now, so how do I know they haven't already deceived me in a similar way, and that my belief that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is not itself the result of their deception? Maybe 2 plus 2 is really 17 billion after all, but, it was here, in the depths of my doubt, that a light finally dawned on my mind, I finally found something I could be, certain of, I, exist, in the Latin, cogito, ergo, soon. I think, therefore, I am. I realized that, even if God were deceiving me about all of these things, God could not deceive me about one thing, I exist. For in order to be deceived, I have to exist. So I realized that this would be the new foundation of the house of knowledge. I exist. And I realized, also, the nature of this, I, that exists. The I that exists is a thinking thing, and nothing more for it is the presence of thought that guarantees my knowledge of my existence, and it is only that presence because I could exist without everything else, as I had already imagined. Now, I wasted no time building a new house of knowledge on this foundation. I was relieved to quickly restore, on a solid foundation this time, my belief in a perfect God. For I noticed that, in my mind, there was a certain idea of God. And that idea was an idea of a perfect being. I also realized that, since I had an idea of a perfect being, and since everything that is caused by something must be caused by something at least as perfect as it is, and since I was not perfect, I could not be the cause of my own idea of a perfect being, and nor could anything else imperfect, the idea of a perfect being could only be caused by a perfect being, and thus, I had proven that a perfect being exists and that perfect being is God, and it gets better, since God is perfect, I was able to restore my belief in the world outside my mind, 
the reliability of reason, and the reliability of my senses, as long as I use them properly, because I could see that I did not create myself, I knew that God had created me. And because God is a perfect being, and therefore is not a total jerk, and because I find in myself a powerful inclination to believe in the existence of a world outside my mind, along with the testimony of my senses and the testimony of reason, because of all this, I knew that God had created me with these instincts to believe, and with these faculties of reason and of the senses, and thus that they were genuine sources of knowledge, thus what I had doubted could now be restored, and I had knowledge of a few things, and on so solid a foundation that I would be able to get knowledge of more things. Now I want to tell you a few things about what I was able to learn by building on the new foundation for knowledge I had built. I learned a lot about the world. I wrote about it in a book. Since the human being is the most obvious link between mind and matter, I studied us closely. And I did some medical research. In all my investigations I observed two things, and was able to draw two conclusions from them. First, I learned that pretty much everything that happens in the physical world can be explained by what we philosophers call, mechanism, the operation of matter according to a few laws of physics. In particular, the body works mechanically, it's just a machine. For example, after studying the circulatory system, I could tell you how it works in pretty good detail, but the really important thing about the circulatory system is how mechanical it is. It's like a clock. It's just a machine. Now, try to understand how important this is. A lot of the old philosophers, from Plato through some of the medievals, thought that the soul runs the body. We live because our souls are animating our bodies, but I'm here to tell you, that's just not true. The body is a physical thing, and it works by itself, as a machine, because that's all it is. More important, my second observation, I observed that matter and mechanism, while they explain the body and practically everything else, don't explain one thing, matter doesn't explain the phenomenon of consciousness, thought. That cannot be explained by matter. There is no way matter can account for, sentience. All of this led me to two conclusions. First, matter is separate from mind. Put differently, immaterial minds exist, separate from matter. Second, no other immaterial things exist, that is to say, there is non-physical reality, namely the soul, or the mind, but the rest of the universe is matter, and the only thing the soul does is, think, it doesn't manage the body. Now let me state more succinctly my dualist theory in metaphysics. There are two kinds of substance in the universe, matter, and mind. Matter is that which takes up space. We philosophers call it, extended. It has height, width, depth, mind is different mind thinks, and it only, thinks. Mind is that which produces consciousness, or else, mind simply is, consciousness. Either way, mind is that which thinks, it is completely independent of matter. Remember earlier in my method of doubt, how I could imagine myself existing without my body. I could even imagine my mind existing without being in any kind of space at all. The simple fact is that mind does not need matter to think. And, of course, a thing can take up space without thinking, so, what matter and mind do are take up space, and think, and, these are not the same thing, they are completely different things, what has matter to do with consciousness, nothing at all, let me try to be as clear as possible, I'm not just saying that I don't know how, matter can produce thought, although that much is true, I'm saying something much more important, not that I don't know how matter can produce thought, but that I know it can't. I know what matter is, and I know what mind is, and matter does not make the mind, oh, and I also need to explain what we are. We are minds. That is to say, the person is the mind. I am a mind. You, are mind, but the mind is linked to the body. So the person is the mind, but it is linked to the body. The best way to say it is that our essential identity is in the mind. But the human being is the combination of mind and body, so the mind is independent of the body, but the human being is not. A mind without a body would be a person, but a human being is a mind, plus a body. I guess I should tell you more about that connection. Here's what it seems to accomplish. The mind directs the motion of the body, telling it how and where and when to move, 
It doesn't keep the body alive it just, controls the body's movement. And the body feeds sensory information to the mind, telling it about the body's physical environment, and that's all. That's the full extent of the influence of the mind on the body, and of the body on the mind. Now you might be wondering, since matter and mind don't have anything to do with each other, how they actually connect. You know what? I have no idea at all. I think I know where it happens. The mind probably connects to the body in this little piece of the brain, called the pineal gland, and that's all I have to say about that. Well, I've been talking for a while, so in case you've forgotten, I was talking about a book I had written, where I explained this, and other things. At first I planned to publish my book, but I was disturbed when I heard what happened to Galileo. I won't say I agreed with everything Galileo said, but I had not noticed anything wrong with it. So when I heard that he was in trouble with the Catholic Church, I got scared. I wondered if I might have accidentally said something wrong too. Now I want you to understand something about me. I'm a good Christian philosopher. I'm a good Catholic philosopher. I proved the existence of God and the immortality of the soul because after all it's a thinking thing, not a body, and it doesn't have any parts so, unlike the body, which falls apart eventually, the soul lasts forever, unless God were to annihilate it. So you can see that I am a very good Christian philosopher, and I would never dream of saying anything that would go against the teachings of the Catholic Church. So what with one thing and another, I decided not to publish everything, not in my own lifetime anyway. But I had to publish something, because, what I've discovered has the potential to be very useful. I've learned a thing or two about how the physical world works. And with my new foundation for knowledge, there's no limit to how far we can take our understanding of the physical world. It is possible to arrive at knowledge highly useful in life. We can replace the old speculative philosophy usually taught in the schools. We can replace it with a practical knowledge, by means of which, Knowing how the physical world works, we can use it to our advantage. We can thus render ourselves the lords and possessors of nature, and this is to be desired, not only for the invention of things we can use to enjoy the world more, but especially for the preservation of physical health, which is without doubt the first and fundamental blessing in life. The content of our thoughts depends so much on the body that medical science has the potential to make us more wise and intelligent. So medical science is the priority. We could free ourselves from an infinity of maladies of body as well as of mind, and perhaps also even from the debility of age, if we could just learn enough about how the body works. That brings me up to the present moment in my life. Since I have dedicated my life to seeking knowledge, and since this scientific knowledge is so important, I want to continue it. But there's a lot of work to do, and life is short. I realize that there are a lot of people of goodwill who might be interested in helping. Well, the best thing they could do is to make a donation. I could really use some money to help out with my experiments. Remember, this is about getting knowledge, which is the best occupation for a human being. This is about the knowledge which formerly was unavailable, but which, I, Descartes, have made available to all. This is about following through on the certain knowledge gained through my method of doubt, and, most importantly, this is about serving mankind, by getting knowledge to improve the world, to fix it up the way we like it. Anyway, that's about it. My name is Rene Descartes, and now you know the story of my life and my quest for knowledge.